Welcome, listeners, to a brand new episode of Nerd Corner Spotlight. And tonight, I am joined by the wonderful and talented actress, Janet Varney. Hello! Uh, hello there, Janet. Can you tell the listeners uh, who don't know who you are and exactly what you do? Uh, sure. Uh, I am, uh, I guess, well known in the sort of animation and con world for being the voice of Korra on The Legend of Korra. Uh, I'm on a show currently called Stand Against Evil, where I play a sheriff who battles demons, uh, created by Dana Gould, who wrote on The Simpsons for many, many, many years. I am uh, on a show called You're the Worst, which is an FX show. I have a podcast called the JV Club Podcast. I produce a comedy festival called SF Sketch Fest. And in a couple of days, uh, my new series, Fortune Rookie, that I wrote and star in and produced uh, and created uh, will be available online on IFC's site. So I'm uh, really excited about that. But that's a lot of stuff. I might have just named uh, too many things and everyone fell asleep while I was talking. No, that's okay. That's okay. It, it's cool when you actually have a long list, um, you know, on, especially on your IMDb. That means you have a lot of work. <laughs> I guess working is good. Working is admittedly good. Oh, yeah. When you're, when you're a working actor, <laughs> that's a good thing. When you're not a uh, working actor and you have to wait tables again, that's a bad thing. <laughs> Boy, I hear ya. I hear ya. I've had so many friends go to L.A. and, you know, with dreams of acting, and usually it ends up, their waiting tables until they can actually get a break yeah it's really i mean it's that's a that's a real thing and it's it really is one of those things where like when people come here or they're considering coming here and they ask me you know for my advice um it's it's such a so much of it is just luck of the draw it's so hard to even give guidance or advice because you know you you, you don't want anyone to think that you're guaranteed to win or that you're guaranteed to fail you know it's just um I usually tell people to take comedy classes and do, you know, stuff like improv and get get on a live stage and, you know, meet other people uh, who are have like interests in the performance and and writing world as quickly as possible, because, uh, you know, that's the fastest way, I think, to get seen by people. But I, I I was very I did not move down here until I already kind of had representation and work. And uh, and I really admire people who have the, you know, the, the willingness and the bravery to take a chance and, and not be in that position because I, I don't think I ever would have done it. I just would have been, you know, too, I just would have been too worried that it wouldn't work out, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And it, it does help if you have like improv skills or anything else like that when it goes into acting, because, you know, you have to think on the fly, especially in auditions. Mm, absolutely. Great point. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Mark Amir, who's, uh, he's an improv artist. Um, he just recently uh, went to L.A. Uh, to meet up with his friend Nathan Fillion, name dropping. Uh, nice. <laughs> and then meet up with uh, another one of my friends, Matthew Mercer. Just have dinner with him and uh, talk with him. Um, you you know him. Matt, uh, Matt Mercer? Yeah. 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 He's, he's a cool guy. He's a cool guy. Absolutely. I, I've been trying to get him to come to cons down here. Um a lot of times though it always interferes with some other project or the thing that he's going to so i'm still trying to get him down here (laughs) keep working sometimes it takes a while i know that from doing the comedy festival like there's so many times when over and over someone will be like oh i can't make it and you know you kind of go oh well maybe this is them just like you know trying to like be polite um but they tell me to keep trying so you know you keep trying and then eventually it actually works out oh yeah definitely uh, I know when I first uh, met you, it was at a, a local convention um, down here in Mesa. Uh, both you and uh, Dante Bosco were guests That's right. there, um, and it was awesome. When I when I saw on uh, the um, the list of guests, I'm like, oh, that's awesome, Janet Varney and, and Dante Bosco. Um, so I actually uh, before Cora, I actually was a fan of you uh, and your career before then. So. When I heard that you were cast as Cora, uh, I found that very interesting. Because um, you did, did you not do voice acting before that? Not much. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I still don't do a ton of it because um, I do so much on camera stuff, uh, and I I didn't believe it either. I mean, I did. I was very 
amazed and and so excited and shocked uh, when I got it because yeah I'm not I'm not uh, you know primarily a voice actor. Oh yeah, but you did a good job. You did a good job, and you have a Thanks. you have a lot of fans that you know uh, look at that you know uh, and then go you know younger fans and then go uh, backwards and look at other stuff that you've done or watch stuff that you're currently doing because your name take is, it. your name is attached. So <laughs> I will take it with much gratitude. Oh, definitely. Um, and you've been to a, a lot of conventions too. Uh, do you have a favorite memory from a convention or like at a panel, somebody did something for you or said something that made you like excited? Oh gosh, I, I feel like that happens every panel I do uh, or every every con I do. There are just um, so many great, like just smart, thoughtful, sensitive people that are part of the con world and uh, and I really understand and, and appreciate and get uh, from the core of my being, you know, the, the feeling of sort of like, maybe you don't necessarily um, feel like you have a community of people in your regular day to day life. And so, you know, the idea of like a Comic Con kind of giving you the opportunity to be with people who are like minded and, and talk about the things you're passionate about. And, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate it. And I feel like you know, in this world of, you know, kind of the social media world where it becomes easier and easier to depersonalize and kind of be disrespectful to people because you, you know, people aren't thinking of them as human beings. Um, I consistently in the con world, I feel like people are treated with respect, even people who, you know, are different from them, who, you know, made that people may disagree with each other. I just feel like there's a level of respect that I personally have seen. I mean, there may be stuff happening I don't know about, but in my experience, uh, it's just like such a positive atmosphere. So I always have a great time when I go to them. And, and, uh, and so it's really hard to, to, to think of just one, you know, I, I think when, um, Cora season four came out, uh, things kind of amped up a little bit in terms of people sharing their personal experiences and things maybe were, you know, a little more emotional even than they already had been, uh, in terms of fans of, of that show and feeling kind of, understood or represented by the brilliant you know writing that our writers uh, you know helmed of course by by Breik by uh, Mark by Mike and Brian were um, were experiencing so you know that that kind of stands out in terms of like being a big deal for for other people uh, in a very public way um, so that I would you know I could use that as an example but it's really just like a small piece of, of what I've been lucky enough to experience kind of from the beginning oh yeah definitely uh now when you were uh did you have to audition for the legend of Korra? i did yeah i did i i i definitely did i there was a kind of a process to it as well so it wasn't even just like you know one audition and then you get it uh there was you know like chemistry reads and callbacks and stuff like that where you know that that those guys they they really have a vision and they are very specific um, about what what they, you know, are looking for. Even when they don't know exactly what it is they're looking for, I feel like they uh, they don't really compromise um, on kind of what, you know, on, on, on any of the kind of Avatar universe stuff. Um, because in part, I think, you know, they recognize that the, the fans are, they really deserve, you know, kind of the best um, version of storytelling or what have you. So yeah, it was, it was a real process. Um, and I was again, like, because especially in this business, uh, you sort of get conditioned to expect things not to work out, uh, kind of for self-preservation purposes and all that. Um, I was, I was just so amazed and, and shocked and excited when I actually, you know, got the part and was able to go forward and, and do it, make the show. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I know that uh, voice acting auditions can be a, a little different than you know, uh, you know, live action films. Um, what was like? Did you? How many times did you have to go into the studio really for uh, like the auditioning process? And did you interact with any of the other voice actors? Yeah, I, 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 I've been asked this before, and I honestly can't remember uh, exactly like what, how many times I went in. Um, what I do remember is that I, I definitely did meet and read with, uh, PJ and Dave 
uh, David Faustino before we got cast. So we did have um, that kind of chemistry read where they had us read together and sort of, you know, get a sense of what our vibe would be together acting on the show. And that was really, that was really fun. It was uh, really cool to, you know, it's, 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 I think typically, you know, always better for actors to get the chance to act um, with their fellow actors. You know, you, somebody else's dynamic brings out maybe something different in you or challenges you in a, in a good way. You kind of want to meet the, the standard of whatever great work they're doing or, you know, I always say like, well, I don't always say it. this is like a very, like, di- like very established thing in, in improv, but this idea of wanting to surround yourself with people who are better than you um, will only make you grow and be better and push yourself. Um, and I think that's, you know, true of, of acting and voice acting too. So um, it, I'm really glad Nickelodeon did that. And I think they, Nickelodeon has always really understood the value of, you know, ensemble recording and, and the way a cast's chemistry can affect how good the show is. So uh, that was a good sign that they that they were, you know, going through that process with the actors as they kind of tried to determine who they were going to cast. Oh, yeah, definitely. And you're, and the cast of Legend of Korra is epic. Like, you have legendary actors uh, oh, yeah. all around, not just voice actors, but, like... Uh, did you did you actually get to meet with uh, J.K. Simmons when when you uh, had lines with him? Oh yeah, we did record we did record together um, as much as possible. Uh, he and I would sometimes not get to be in the same room together just because of our shooting schedules, but um, but plenty of times uh, we got we got to to read together. And yeah, it was a complete privilege. And uh, I've told the story before, but the the first time we recorded together. Um, Uh, Andrea Romano you know we moved on to a scene that was you know like a Cora and Tenzin scene and she said okay we're you know we're next up we're gonna do you know whatever scene six with uh, Cora and Tenzin and I I actually said like I'm sorry Andrea could you actually say we're moving on to the scene with Janet Varney and J.K. Simmons just so I can hear my name said next to his and he (laughs) laughed and you know but like gave me a hard time about that in a very adorable, wonderful way. He's amazing. Oh yes, yes. He's he's one of those actors you like. I I want to be in. I don't care if he's just a, you know a voice in a show. I want to be like next to him. Oh because yeah. Because of you know name recognition as well, like J.K. Simmons, you know Oscar winner. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, he hadn't won it then. Oh but, yeah, um, no, no, yeah. But when I saw, yeah, when I saw he was nominated, I was like, if he doesn't win, I'm gonna lose my mind. Like he couldn't deserve it more. And then he got ripped. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're like, okay, so we're gonna get to see him ripped in the in the Justice League film? Nope, no, we're not gonna see him ripped in the Justice League film. What? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of actors in here. I um I know Stephen Yoon. Um, one one of um, uh, nothing against you. I and I and I try to tell this to other actors when I try to say some of my favorite episodes of the season. But um, you know, Juan did there's a two oh, yeah. episode of Juan. I it's really wanted episode. to see that as a whole season. Like, Me too. That could have lasted Absolutely. as a whole season instead of just a two parter. I thought that Absolutely. It, it was just beautiful how you know your character connected with Juan and then we got to see you know Juan's backstory and help Cora you know uh, remember who she was but oh yeah just an incredible two-parter um, and like I said all, all the actors in the series um, are big name actors um, and I, I just thought it amped up from uh, the original Avatar um, Last Airbender uh, and just uh, it set a higher bar in my opinion um, uh, there were some people that loved the original uh, more, and then um, there are other people that love Korra more, and some people are just balanced in that area. Well. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. we love it all. We, we would love yeah. to see it live action. And I know that they are making a live action um, Avatar film, or, or series, series um, yeah. that's going to be hopefully better Boy. than what we got. By, by, I think uh, everybody's a little nervous, but oh, yeah. yeah. But I would have loved to also see a, a live action uh, Legend of Korra film or a series after that as well. Um, sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so let's let's go on. We'll probably come back to Korra, but I really want to go go on to some of your other projects as well because we, I could talk sure. about 
the Legend of Korra until the cows come home. <laughs> uh, but, sure thing. But uh, I know you've, you've done a lot of other projects, and um, I want to know about your current project right now that you're working on. Yeah, well, I guess that probably would be um, Fortune Rookie, which is a, a, a show that I created. I actually um, have been working on it in some form or other for several years now. Um, I, the idea actually did come out of me, uh, seeing a psychic for the first time and might I add last time in my life so far anyway. Uh, and, uh, just kind of like what that, it was an experience that I thought about for a long time afterwards, not really for the reasons I would like, which, you know, I would love to say like, Oh my God, he's predicted all the stuff that came true and all this kind of stuff. It was not that it was much more like, Oh, so that, you know, that I did not have one of those experiences. And like, I sort of was struggling to like make the things that he said fit and, uh, you know, also making fun of myself kind of for, for having been like, cause I've, 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 for my entire life, I've wanted to believe like I'm very Fox Mulder, you know, it's like, I want, I want to see a ghost. I want to be in a haunted house. I want to, you know, believe that aliens have visited the earth. I want to believe in psychics. Like I, I love the supernatural. I love sci-fi and fantasy. And, um, and so I, I always joke that I feel like I'm like so open that I'm like, Hey, I'm right here, everybody. And like consistently, I just don't ever feel like I have those kind of experiences that other people report having so this unfortunately was another one of those and uh and so i just started um developing this idea that has now uh become this show fortune rookie in which a kind of you know alternate universe version of me janet barney is told by somebody who claims to be a psychic just very randomly like in a bathroom um the psychic is like oh you know that you too have the gift and even though up to that point, uh, Janet Varney did not believe in psychics, she is also like narcissistic enough to suddenly decide that she is really important and that she is psychic. And it gives her the opportunity to quit show business. And so she starts uh, very quickly decides to become a full time kind of fortune teller with zero experience and zero skills and very quickly finds out that it is a lot harder than she thought it was going to be. And um, this, the, the, our first little season uh, has a kind of, has a lot of different things that happen in bits and pieces that feel like they're, I think, connected to my background in sketch, but also has this kind of overarching storyline and plot that's developing um, through the show. And uh, it, James Roday, uh, star of Psych, largely figures into that um, uh, because he feels that I stole my idea for being a psychic from having been on his show, Psych, <laughs> which is true in real life. So we have this like very meta, weird, you know, multi-layered thing where it's like James Roday and Janet Varney are talking about how Janet Varney was on James Roday's show Psych, but it's also not real life. And they're, you know, we're referencing things that never happened and that kind of stuff. So um, I loved playing with like my sort of real life relationships with famous people. You know, Fred Armisen is in it and um, Steve Agee and Tim Omenson also from Psych. Scott Adsit, who's the voice of Big Hero, so who's voice of, uh, you know, sort of main voice in Big, Big Hero 6 um, and uh, and uh, Baymax, I should say. And uh, and, you know, it was on uh, 30 Rock and some people play themselves and some people Play characters and it's just like we have animation and music and it's very weird and very I think wonderful and I'm so excited for for people to see it that sounds awesome um so this is sort of like um are you guys sort of like parroting your actual selves yeah that's a way? great way of putting it. you yeah. just say it said it so much more succinctly <laughs> than I ever could because I've seen other celebrities do this, like in uh, like shows where they have to play themselves, um, because you know they're out in the real world, um, but then they just go, you know, like uh, what was it? Uh, Don't trust a bee in apartment uh, twenty three. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, James Van Der Beek totally. is a completely like caricature of himself, not not actual, you know, James Van Der Beek, right. and, and it's like oh. Okay, so is he really that egotistical? Like, no, he's not really that egotistical. It's just yeah. It's just a you know, 
uh, a parody of himself. It's like it, what he probably wants to be or something to that effect. Like, right. Uh, uh, well, I think, yeah, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think, um, I think for, for me, like, I just, I, you know, I know James, I've known him for years. Um, I, the version of myself that I play is like a toting that and, you know, um, like weirdly materialistic in ways that I'm not and like weirdly, you know, sort of socially uh, and, and slightly maybe like more like PC inept. I mean, she, you know, and, and, and when I was writing for, for James, I was like, you know, I think he's going to love playing this like kind of like sad version of himself um, and I, I was right. And I think that the, the instinct is there because typically, um, people like when we, when they do what we do, we kind of think it's so weird that people know who we are anyway. I mean, there are people who like feel they were born to be famous or, you know, there are people who, um, don't think about that at all other than to be like, yeah, I'm pretty amazing. Like it makes sense that people want to get my autograph. You know, there are certainly oh, yeah. I've met those people kinds like that. of people. I've met people like but, that. But yeah, yeah. But the ones I gravitate towards and what I'm very happy to say that the, you know, dominating amount of people, certainly in my experience in voiceover and in, in comedy, um, kind of can't believe that someone would want to get their autograph and they they think it's they're so honored and they're kind of embarrassed by it because they know what a dork they are which is why i do my podcast the jv club i'm so intent on just like kind of stripping away this idea that you know if 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 you're an actor and and someone likes your work that that somehow means that you're you've got it together more (laughs) for me it's really um I, I, for me, it's more about kind of leveling the playing field and just like making sure everyone knows that we're all human beings and we all have these vulnerabilities and stuff. And so I think for me, getting it when, when you're asking someone to play quote unquote themselves, what becomes much more fun is like, let's blow out all the things I'm glad I'm not, or I'm trying not to be, or, you know, what would, what would the jerk version, you know, like Rode is so good at playing these you know, lovable kind of assholes. Right. And so when you give him the opportunity to play himself, he, and he's, and he's bringing that to the table. Um, it's so much more interesting and funny and fun to watch than, you know, I think sometimes the way we actually are, which is like just sort of a goofball, you know, or sad (laughs) or sad. (laughs) It's like, I have an addiction. (laughs) I'm like, Oh no. (laughs) Yeah. I, yeah, we probably don't want to. Yeah. It's like, uh, I guess we could skip that. I'm going to be in rehab again. Sorry, producers, <laughs> I got to cancel. Uh, what? <laughs> bless, bless their hearts. That's no. a, a, a anybody who goes through that. It's a, another re- reminder that fame and fortune do not solve the world's problems. No, it doesn't. You know, uh, yeah. uh, at uh, Fan X, uh, they were supposed to have uh, Ben Affleck as yeah. a guest, and they had to cancel because he fell off the wagon again. So. It yeah. doesn't matter if you're rich and famous and an A-lister, you can still have normal problems with like a regular, per, a regular human being. I've and to, yeah, yeah. And, and you can, and a regular human being, you know, it's, it's, it's all a trade-off and everyone's reality is unique to themselves. And it's like, I can't imagine going through that with that kind of microscope and that kind of, you know, like giant camera on your face as you're just like dealing with your vulnerabilities of being a human being. It just seems like it would be so stressful. It would make it even worse, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And I always find, you know, um, a difference between actors that, you know, are kind of like, um, they're kind of not obviously born into it because, you know, their parents were celebrities, but actors that really have to work their way up the ladder that Mm -hmm. go from unknown to known. And it sometimes, some people don't get famous until like their thirties or later. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, but they've been struggling for decades to just get yeah. you know, noticed. And I yeah. find that very admirable because they've, they've been in the shit <laughs> and they, yeah. and they That's haven't right. had, a, they haven't had, you know, you know, a, a silver spoon, you know, you know, in their mouth the whole time. And, um, well, yeah, I think like you look like you look at someone like John Hamm, you know, he was a teacher. Um, and, and he didn't become famous until, you know, late thirties, early forties, I, I, you know, and, and, uh, and there's a perfect example of somebody who, you know, God, he does, he has two feet on the ground at all times because he's so connected to just like a normal reality, you know? 
he looks like somebody that just you want to sit down and have a beer with. Like he's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, Fortune Rookie. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Stand Against Evil. Now this show. Yay! Is awesome. Yes. Oh, good. I feel the same. Yes. So uh, tell me, uh, like, when you first read the script for the uh, pilot episode, uh, what were what were your first thoughts? on it oh i thought it was hilarious um i also had the the distinction and the the very unusual distinction in this particular project of kind of knowing the process because dana um for some reason uh in our lives of knowing each other in the comedy world he got some kind of weird impression that like i'm some kind of a badass i think it's just because i like riding a bike and he (laughs) probably was like comedians don't exercise uh but uh but he had this idea in mind um, from the beginning for me to be this sheriff in this situation. Uh, and so he, he let me know, um, you know, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this thing and, you know, uh, I, I'm writing this character for you, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get the role. You're going to have to audition for it. And I'm real sorry if you don't get it, <laughs> which is like such a weird pressure uh, which we totally laughed about, but I have had that happen in the past. And, and many of my friends have where, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky enough to have friends who are very gifted writers and, uh, a friend will, will write a role and say, you know, I wrote this to be this, you know, this person. And, um, like things will happen where like, so, so something, someone will read like a character description and it will be like, you know, a Dante Bosco type. And it's like, Dante is reading that. And it's like, I am Dante Bosco. Why don't you just give it to me? You know? <laughs> yes. So it's like, you just, uh, once again, and I was like, I was saying earlier, you know, you condition yourself to, uh, to think something's not going to happen. Uh, and, and it's often because we know what that feels like. So I was like, I, we, we would joke around during the process of him writing it where I would, we, you know, I would be like, don't worry, we're still going to be friends. We're still going to be friends, like just as a foregone conclusion that I was not going to get to do it. Um, and I did audition for it and I did up getting, you know, getting the role. And, and so it was definitely a confluence of like everything actually working out, which is rare and wonderful. And so uh, there's a long way around answering your question, but by the time I was reading the pilot script, you know, I sort of had known enough about what was in store. Uh, that being said, I, I'm constantly surprised and delighted by how brilliantly funny Dana is. So, um, I never, I'm never not looking forward to finding out what's going to happen, you know, in, in, in the season and the upcoming season of Stan and reading the scripts and, finding out what kind of crazy ideas, you know, he's had for the season. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, what is it like working with John C. McGinley? Now, I've always loved his work, I, and I, you know, I thought he was hilarious in Scrubs. Um, what was it like uh, working with him? Uh, oh, I love Johnny. He's, he's amazing. Uh, he's, you know, it's one of those situations where uh, we didn't like he was out of the country for we did a a little table read uh when we first arrived in atlanta which is where we shoot the show so for the first season before we started our first day of shooting uh the cast we sat you know sat down and did a table read and it was the first time i ever met deborah and first time i ever met nate um and so but johnny couldn't be there in time he was flying in from i think ireland and so the, our first day of working together, we had never met. Like we shook hands and then I swear, I, I feel, I mean, my memory of it is like, we shook hands, like we both, he was familiar with me. I was obviously familiar with him. So we came into it with massive respect for each other's work. And, you know, we knew, we knew that we really loved what the other person had been doing in their career thus far. Uh, but we didn't get a chance to really like rehearse or, you know, hang out and have a beer or whatever. Uh, and so the first day that we worked together, like it just snapped into place so quickly and it felt so normal and like fluid and it felt like we'd worked together a ton before, uh, that it was like, you know, just, I guess it was a relief too. Cause you just, you know, you can't ever really know, uh, what that's going to be like on both sides. And so I was just, I was like, oh my God, like we both just gelled immediately. And 
he's been um, such a massive supporter of mine and my work on the show and um, it just has believed in me so much. And, and it, you know, I, I've learned a ton from him. Um, it's just been a total, total blast. That's fantastic. And, and all the actors on the show, do you guys kind of like improv a lot of your stuff? Like, does it, does it go off script sometimes or do, uh, do they do you just stick with the script? Uh, it definitely does. You know, Dana loves uh, for us to improv. Um, and, and, and I think part of that is because, you know, when he and the writers are working on a script, uh, they sort of, you know, hammered into the ground. They're doing multiple drafts after a certain point. Maybe they forget whether something, you know, they're like they've lost confidence in whether something's funny anymore just by virtue of seeing it over and over again. And so he always says that he, you know, his favorite stuff uh, at the end of the day ends up being stuff we've improvised. But then we are all very quick to say, well, there. first of all, the scripts are brilliant. You just lose sight of that, Dana, because you have to see them a million times more than we do. But second of all, I think if the scripts weren't there, if they weren't brilliant on their own and we didn't know we were getting great stuff, uh, period, I don't think that we would feel the freedom to be a little more playful and get you know some new, different, nuanced things and to get to improvise together and come up with maybe some new stuff. And so some of it ends up in the show and you know some of it doesn't. Um, but, but if he weren't so funny and if the writing wasn't so great and funny, I don't think we would be able to riff off of it, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and for any of the uh, listeners, uh, that are listening currently, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the new season will premiere, uh, October 31st of this year. So yep, believe, yep. It'll drop got, on I, Halloween, and then I think we have a. Then it's regularly. It's usually regularly on Wednesdays. I believe at ten. Unless but, I uh, see, but the first like, two seasons it. are available. Yeah, the first two seasons are series are uh, first two seasons. I should say are um, available on Hulu, which is great. Yep. Um, and then you can usually see it even if you don't have IFC, uh, if you don't have cable, if you don't have a cable supporter that has IFC, because it's definitely one of those like it's always been a very niche. Um, like subversive show, you know, network. Uh, it, it, you can almost always see it online uh, or on the IFC app. Like, it's still uh, available to be seen. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Now let's let's go back. Let's go back in time. Because <laughs> uh, I know you're you're from you're from Arizona. I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and. Uh, when you when you graduated, were you thinking of going into acting or uh, originally um, when you when you graduated, like as a career? Yeah. Well, I I kind of I did get uh, I can't believe I'm using this expression. I did get bit by the acting bug fairly early. Um, I definitely like I remember uh, being so excited when I my parents put me in a just a you know public school part of the the Tucson United Public School System, whatever TUSD stands for. I had to think about that for a second. The Tucson United School District? I don't know. Um, but it was a pu public school, and, and it was a magnet school um, that focused on the arts. And um, and they so they I remember, you know, kind of getting into first grade and, uh, and being able to audition for a play. And I don't know why. Like, I couldn't tell you why... I don't, it's just weird. It's weird when you're five because I've skipped kindergarten. It's weird when you're five and somehow you already have a sense that like it would be fun to you know, memorize lines, however minimal they might be for a five-year-old's production of something. But I did. And, and so I definitely knew really early on that I loved performing. And so that was a huge part of you know, the decisions we made as to like what other public schools I went to over time. And, and I did major in theater. Um, but uh, somewhere in the, the, I don't know, even by the time I was going to college, I did my first two and a half years at M NAU, which is in Flagstaff. And then I moved to San Francisco. Um, I, I sort of lost the thread of believing that I could have a career in performance. And I think I got scared that, you know, doing something like that and trying to make a living at it would make me hate doing it because it would be so stressful. I was very pragmatic. Uh, and so I kind of abandoned the whole idea for a good long time. When I moved to San Francisco, I, I really wasn't pursuing performing. In that iteration, I was in a band and playing guitar and singing and stuff. But 
I wasn't really performing. And, and when I, uh, when I, when I moved and, and lived in San Francisco for a year to establish California residency and then paid my way through SF state, I kept my theater major because I had already done so many credits in it, but I didn't perform. I wasn't in any plays, uh, really, um, until I met the guys with whom I ended up founding the sketch troupe, um, and, and then consequently the festival, uh, SF sketch fest, but we were, I, I really had, to, I got pulled into that kicking and screaming and it wasn't through the theater department. It was just like through friends I'd met and, uh, it was pretty much after college anyway. So, um, a lot of people like now, you know, when I reconnect with people I went to high school with, or, you know, even junior high or grade school, they're very, a lot of them are very quick to go like, we always knew it, like you did it. You know, and, and I always feel like I want to, I, I, a lot of the time I'm like, well, like you're kind of overlooking like a five to 10 year period where I wasn't planning on doing this and had, you know, was thought I was going to like own a home furnishing shop in, in San Francisco, you know, and then that, that was going to be my life's calling. So, um, I kind of came back around to it, but, uh, but I did have a span in there where, you know, I, I absolutely was not planning on doing this. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. You know, um, especially when uh, you hear you hear stories from uh, young actors, you know, coming up, and of course, you know, they are expecting to, you know, make a career out of that because you know they started off really young. But yeah. uh, you, you you came you came out of college, you know, looking at that, but wonder you know pretty much, uh, you know, kind of almost sort of trying to be realistic. Like maybe yeah. I can make it, maybe I can't make it. I don't know. It's really hard out in, in in LA or in general the entertainment industry. It doesn't matter if it's acting or music or anything else like that. Um, sure. Because you have so many other people that are trying to do the same exact thing you're doing, and yeah. um, especially when you show up to those auditions, um, you see like a hundred people right in front of you. Yeah. And you're like, oh my god, uh, am I going to get the part? So. Yeah. And there's, I mean, I think that's something that you kind of have to make peace with pretty early on. It's like, there's always going to be someone who's better looking than you, who's more talented than you, who's a better songwriter than you, who's a better editor than you, who's a better director than you. Um, that's always going to exist. Um, and a lot of the time with acting, you know, if you can get it into your head early on that it, there's so many things that go into it that, uh, you know, of course that you can't control, but also just like, you know, you, you might be the bet, the quote unquote objective and stuff so subjective, but you might be the best quote unquote actor in a group, but you just don't fit what they have in their brains. And, and that's not anyone's fault, you know? And I think that's, what's I think really helpful for young people who are interested in, in making films or, you know, doing plays is like, try to get some experience in every side of it. Because once you've directed something or once you've written something and you've been the person who's casting and you're looking at all these actors, um, it was so helpful to understand where all these different the, these different people are coming from when they come together to make this thing. Um, it makes you take things a lot less personally, I think, which is really important when you're an artist of any kind, whether you're a painter, a writer, photographer, etc., uh, it's, it's hard because everything feels so personal and, um, and it is personal because you, you know, it's your art, but, um, when you are allowed to step away from it and look around and go, Oh, so there's a million other things that aren't personal that have a huge play in whether or not something happens for me, you know, um, then it's just easier to be like kinder to yourself, you know, and not be uh, so self-centered. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now let's go on to um, riff tracks. Now I'm a huge fan of riff tracks. I I watched, Love them. I I grew up with Mystery Science Theater 2000. Um, I'm 33, so I've you know started very early on while they were pretty much almost like on public access almost. You know, just yeah. All that all that you know old stuff. Pretty much no budget whatsoever until they went yes. to Comedy Central, and. Yeah. Um, and it was sad when they canceled the show. Uh, but I've yeah. always loved Mystery Science Theater 3000 and uh, I loved Riff Tracks. Uh, what was it like um, doing Riff Tracks um, when the, the uh, episodes you were on? Well, that's another thing. You know, there's there's these moments that um, that 
were, you know, if you if you are lucky enough to have them uh, in the in the performing world, that um, you know, still kind of feel like pinch me moments where you're like, oh my god, if you know, if 13 year old me could see me right now, they would not believe you know, how lucky I am. And I think it's really important to stay connected to those moments and, uh, and, and, you know, stay grounded. And, and that doesn't mean that you need to like freak out and fangirl out every time you work with a hero or that might get a little bit, um, exhausting. But, uh, but I think for Cole and I, same thing as you, you know, we grew up, uh, by the way, it's, I, I've, I've quickly learned that no one wants to hear you say that you grew up with something they did because it just makes them feel old. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I've done that so many times and going, "Oops, I just bit my tongue." Sorry. I mean, no, I mean, like it's it, it, it's true. I grew up. I feel I grew up watching them, but but you know, I also realized like, oh yeah, probably you don't want to hear that, guys. Um, especially when like you know, there's when people start doing things so young, it's like you know, I could say you know, it's funny. I've like I I. I recently podcast an actress that I, I haven't released the episode yet, but I've you know known who she was since I was a kid, but she and I are basically the same age. So I can literally say I grew up watching you, but it's, she was also growing up the same time as me. So it's kind of funny when it's a little bit different like that. But anyway, I, I'm getting off the point. Uh, I, I can't believe that I am in a situation where I get to work with those guys um, that I can call them friends uh, is, is, it's just sublime. Um, I'm such fans of theirs. I feel like um, they helped shape my sense of humor as it exists now. And so to have something like that come full circle where you actually are getting a chance to express something that, you know, involves the very people who influenced you to like what you like. Um, it, it, it's phenomenal. It's, 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 it got to be like, you know, one of the very best, if not the best parts of getting to do what I do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, and you were very funny on all of them. I, I, I try not to miss any of the episodes. I think it's, I've, I've listened to pretty much every single one of their uh, uh, episodes oh, they have on there. that's so cool. I'll have so, you tell me that you're a huge fan, that, that well, they, they just really love and appreciate hearing that. I, I've been trying to get an interview with them for years. So it's it's kind of like, you know, it's either because of, you know, they're busy or anything else like that. But, you know, it's I, I take it with, you know, um, in the way of like, yes, I understand that, you know, scheduling is hard for, you know, a lot of Well, and they don't live in the same city. So I know. That, that's yeah, also, that, that's I think, hard. yeah, a constant challenge for them. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, Cole and I, <laughs> we actually could be doing it way more often if we had time to, we have a movie that we started on. I kid you not. Like, I mean, however, whenever the last time was that we released a new riff track, um, we started we already had the next one lined up and we started working on it. And then, um, we just could never, ever find, it takes a long time to write that stuff. And, uh, and so we just haven't had time to finish it. And it's kind of hilarious. Now we like joke about it when, when we actually do see each other, we're like, Hey, remember how we're supposed to still be writing that thing that we love. And, and, and who knew that we would ever get to a point in our lives where like, we couldn't, we didn't have time to do a riff tracks. Because again, it's like, are you kidding me? Like if you told my 13 year old self that, that 13 year old self would slap me in the face and be like, are you crazy? Yeah. Like you're, what are you talking about? Well, so, uh, so it's something that we both like just absolutely love. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I hope that we get a chance to um, finish up the one, the one that we started and uh and get get that out into the world but um but it, it's it's an absolute blast absolute blast and again just total honor uh the live shows that we have done with with eyes um at Sketchfest and and actually uh a co now a couple of other places uh they um or have we done them in a couple other places? Sorry. Now I'm like, I know we were supposed to do them in DC and then we couldn't do it. So now I can't remember if we've actually done it in other places. It's kind of a blur, but, um, but we would again, like perform with those guys all day, every day, if we had a choice. Oh yeah. And, and that's another thing. You are the co-founder of uh, San Francisco sketch fest. I know. God, I can't believe it. It's turning 18 this year. Speaking of feeling old, <laughs> You still, so look, you still look very young. I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> you Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, let, let's uh, let's go in full circle where we originally started talking about uh, Legend of Korra, because uh, I wanted to also talk about your other projects as well. But um, with the fourth season of Legend of Korra that, that came out, were you aware of where the writers were going with your character, especially in the, in the uh, series finale? I, we were, um, I, you know, it wasn't something that we knew about, you know, it's not, it's not like we had like some inside scoop, you know, three seasons, uh, before it happened. Um, because for one thing, like nothing was set in stone that early on. Um, they, you know, they were really doing one season at a time. They knew they were going to do four seasons, but, uh, they would focus on, on each new season as, you know, as it began, they could start writing it. Um, but they did tell us, uh, the guys that told Seychelles and me, um, I think, you know, before any of the other actors, in fact, uh, kind of where the show was headed and we were both really excited about it. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, uh, representation is important. Um, did you, did you go online and try to, you know, check out the comments of people, you know, talking about that because when the information came online and, to, you know, to talk about you know, Cora, and then all of a sudden, you know, she's now bisexual. Um, did they, did you uh, check out the comments or do you try to stay away from those threads? I stay so far away from just about everything online. Um, I am so uh, tender hearted and I'm, I'm very susceptible to like having my heart broken if someone says something mean about me, but I don't look at any of that stuff because even if you know, I feel like it's like the chances are decent that it's going to be nice stuff. I'm like, why would I ever take that risk? So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't look at anything at all. I can only say that, you know, the, the good thing is that because I do so many live cons, you know, in person stuff, um, I got to experience feedback, uh, and still do, um, that way and uh you know it's a lot less likely that someone's going to be mean to your face so i have been very lucky to have primarily positive stuff but you know i definitely have people uh, almost every convention who you know the, who feel that it's important to tell me that they wish that cora would have ended up with mako or you know they felt like the bisexuality was forced in some way and you know all i can say is like i totally understand uh people's opinions are stuff that um I feel very passionate about that. I, I, you know, I, while I respect the choice that a, that a writer or, you know, um, makes, uh, that I sort of secretly wish it had gone another way. Like I completely get that and I get how important this to people. Um, and all I can say is, you know, I had the, the, I had the honor and the responsibility of working with, with Mike and Brian on a regular basis. And I'm, t they're just total heroes to me. So the last thing I personally would ever do is question their, you know, intentions. And so when people, you know, anybody who says like it seemed forced or whatever, all I can say is like, you're wrong. Like you can, it may feel that way to you. That may be how you perceive it, but that's absolutely not the reality. Um, but like I said, you know, you, people, we're all entitled, you know, when Mike and Brian also know, like, you know, when you put something out into the world, it doesn't belong to just you anymore. And that's one of the most exciting things about art, right? For all of us, whether it's how you interpret a painting or a song or a show. Um, and so they totally get that, like, you know, it's going to incite different feelings and different people and stuff. But, um, but I, you know, I just happen to be one of the people who, you know, is really just like absolutely love the outcome. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it really started a conversation online with uh, especially mm. with animated shows about about representation about not, not just you know diversity in that area but also you know uh uh gender and sexuality type of you know situations in in uh, animated shows and um i mean it, it's not the first one to do it but it really was like at least for this generation i think one of the earlier ones that a lot of people remember yeah so, um yeah, I, I found it very interesting. I wanted to see more. Like, I wanted to see, you know, Korra and Asami later on. I think there was a comic book of that. Yeah, there's this. Yeah, there, there, there are books, um, and and they're still being written. Because um, I was just in touch with uh, with uh, one of the uh, one of the guys very recently, and they were in the middle of working on on stuff. So um, it's definitely in. There's only stuff out there. Um, uh, uh, 
Irene Co did a phenomenal job illustrating um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful artwork and uh, and great storytelling. Um, and uh, and I definitely recommend. Uh, yeah, I definitely recommend the the reading if if you want to see more of Cora and Asami's adventures together. That's fantastic. All right, and uh, let's see. We're, we're getting to the end of our interview. Let, uh, let's talk a little bit about the JV Club because you talked a little bit about it early on. Um, and for listeners who don't know that you have a podcast yourself, can you tell them a little bit about your podcast? Sure, yeah. So my podcast, as we've established, is uh, called the JV Club. I started it, I think, uh, well, almost 300 episodes ago, which I think translates to six or seven years, something like that. And uh, I I usually talk to women guests. Um, in the summer, I talk to men. Uh, and that's called my Boys of Summer series. Uh, oh, but the nice. rest of the year, I, I, I interview women. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think the, the thing that I always make sure I spend some time on is what the adolescence of that person was like. Uh, because I find, again, that, like, the, the way that we experience um, our teenagerhood is... Um, like very unique and special but at the same time it's also kind of something that I think there are I, I just have a lot of people in my life who have experiences where they feel like teenagers and then they're like I'm 35 years old like why do I feel like a teenager like have I not outgrown this jealousy or have I not outgrown this insecurity or why am I still getting zits like you know basically everything there's something about uh, being a teenager that like, I think there's like a direct line from whatever age you are afterwards. There's some kind of like weird direct, like telepathic connection to your teenage self. And sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker depending on what's going on in your life. But um, it's a way for me to get to know the guests in a very human, very vulnerable way without prying into their present lives. Cause I don't want to do that. Um, but you know, when people get some distance from their teenage selves, I think they're able to talk about it with, you know, some perspective and humor and are, um, able to share of themselves without, you know, necessarily having to get into like their daily routine in the present, you know? So for me, it's been, um, one of my favorite things that I've, I've had the privilege of being able to do in, in my career and my work and just in my regular life, because, um, I have made, you know, lasting friendships with women that I didn't even know before, I had them on the podcast. Uh, I really, I just continue to be amazed at how everyone has such a different story, but there are just these underlying themes that connect everyone um, to each other in like really profound and comforting ways. And I just, it's funny. It's a funny podcast. I, you know, it's not all like just like totally in depth stuff, but it's, uh, there's a lot of sincerity in there and there's again, a lot of vulnerability. And so you know, when Alison Breed tells the story of how she, you know, wet her pants at a gymnastics contest, um, I think that's just like, it only serves to remind us all that we're all human. And I, again, if I had to like boil down my, what I would hope would be, leave an, any kind of a legacy at all in my work, it would be that people feel like, you know, nobody's better than anybody else. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, that, that's, I would love to talk to Alison Bree. I'm a huge fan of hers. She's amazing, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we uh, we talked about uh, JV Club. Um, let's see. What else? Hold on a second. I had a list, and it just, <laughs> I, I accidentally closed it. <laughs> I, I went up and, no I, and, I, and I pressed I pressed uh, like back, and I was next to the escape area, and I accidentally yep. closed it. So that's I've been there. That's uh, that's a thing. That's well, the thing. only other thing that uh, that pops into my mind right away, just because uh, I know it's coming out very soon, is the final fifth season of this show called You're the Worst, in which I play a complete asshole. Um, it's just a it's a fantastic show. It's uh, again, it's uh, from the FX networks um, and it is. Uh, yeah, has a, has this last season coming up, um, I think later this. No, it's God, it's got a premiere got a premiere in October. I really should have that information, so I better find out. I, like I said, I've just, as you know, uh, Jeremy, I just got back from Europe, and um, when you go away, it feels like five months have passed, even though two weeks passed. Oh, yeah. It's January. So, uh, January <laughs> yeah. 2019. Yeah. So. yeah, exactly. So, um, But anyway, yeah, it's it's a fantastic show, and I think it's available on uh, Hulu as well. In fact, I know it is. So if you miss the shows, watch them on Hulu+. Plus. Mm-hmm. Or in my case, that's Hulu, right. Hulu Plus Plus, because that's there's, right. there's oh, an actual nice. 
other Hulu Plus that you have to purchase to get even oh limited uh, commercials because you still get commercials yep, that's right. on the regular Hulu Plus, which is that's very exactly strange. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So um, where can people find you online? They can find me on Instagram at the JV Club, and they can find me on Twitter at Janet Varney. I have a website, JanetVarney.com. There's a FortuneRookie.net, uh, and then you can get the JV Club podcast anywhere you get podcasts. That's fantastic. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to pimp anything else out on this podcast. Oh my God. I mean, if I pimp anything else out, I'm, I, I, people, again, people, their brains will explode because we already dumped a whole lot on them. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been great talking to you. Uh, you too. And, um, check out all her, uh, social media accounts and also her website. Um, and be sure to, uh, check out, um, what was it? <laughs> Fortune Rookie. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. No, check out Fortune Rookie. Yes. Check out Fortnite Rookie! And also check out the uh, <laughs> next season of Stand Against Evil this October. That's right. Oh, yes. And also, um, You're the Worst, coming this January. Awesome. Uh, okay. No, it's I think it's coming this month. It, it should premiere this month as well. Okay, all right. Yeah. But you're, yep. the, you're the worst? Okay, all right. Well, I'm just, I'm just following Wikipedia. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> funny. Well, I don't know why it would come out in January. That'd be crazy. I don't, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, we finished, we finished shooting it, but... Uh, that can't be right. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Uh, thank you, Janet, for being on the show. Uh, thank you, listeners, for listening in. And remember to enjoy your chibichanga. That's right. <laughs>